our first month we sold 65 cards. 30 days into it, I knew I didn't want to do anything else for the rest of my life. Why, why is that? Because I made more money in that month than I would make usually in a year. <laughs> Can you really lose money on every car but still make money on every deal? For this dealer, it's not just a bad dream, it's in his business plan, and it's very profitable. Today, I'm speaking with Ali Hanna, dealer principal for Hanna Cars, a three-store independent dealer group. We discuss selling his first car behind a service center at 30 years old, how he runs his $200 million a year used car business in two states, can his newest acquisition succeed where others have failed before him, and much more. Don't forget to click subscribe so you never miss an episode. What's up, everyone? This is Car Dealership Guy. You're listening to the Car Dealership Guy podcast, which is my effort to give you access to the most transparent insights into the car market. Well, before we get into the show, this episode is brought to you by my very own Car Dealership Guy industry job board. I hear it every day. CDG, why aren't you charging money for this? My answer, because I can. CDGjobs.com, my industry job board connecting the best talent in automotive with the best companies, will remain absolutely free for CDG listeners to post and fill available roles at their companies. This free job board is for anyone in automotive, vendors, dealers, lenders, manufacturers, auto tech, everyone. Already, over 100 companies have posted open positions, including Lithia Motors, Recurrent, Credit Acceptance, Vero's Credit, Cars Commerce, Shift Digital, Plug, Full Path, Westlake, Trade Pending. You get the point. The best part is that when these companies hire through cdgjobs.com, they are hiring the most informed candidates in the marketplace. So don't hesitate. You can add your open roles today by visiting cdgjobs.com or clicking the link in the show notes below. That's cdgjobs.com. Ellie Hanna on the CDG podcast. Ellie, welcome. Thank you, Yossi. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. I'm excited because you told me it's the first podcast you've ever done. That's number one. Uh, number two, I'm excited because you're a used car guy, and it's been it's been a minute since we had a, a a good you know good old used car guy on the podcast telling how it is. So I'm pumped for this. I want to get started with really your your upbringing in this business, how you even got started with Hannah Imports. Give us some of the background. I'll give you all the background. Actually, I'm I'm from Lebanon. I grew up in Beirut, moved here when I was uh, almost 18 to go to NC State University and um, never had any intention to be in the car business whatsoever. Uh, uh, went uh, to NC State for uh, an engineering degree and out of college, I moved to New York City and got a job in the um, engineering field. Uh, I was there for almost six years. I was there during September 11, actually, I was in New York City. And um, I never really fell in love with the engineering business. And um, I always knew at some point I would find something else to do. So I moved back to North Carolina and um, <clears throat> and um, looked for a different field. And I stumbled into the car business. I didn't work in the car business until I was 30 years old. And I'm 47 now. So, so tell me more about that, right? Like when you say stumbled, so you moved back to North Carolina. What, what what does that mean to you? Did you just start selling cars, you know, flipping cars or what really I happened? I started going with a friend of mine to the auction when I had extra time on my hand. I would buy a car, then I would buy two cars. I would put them at somebody else's lot. And at some point I had 10 or 15 cars and I quit my job. And uh, I started selling behind a, a service shop. I would actually do paperwork on the back of a car. Uh, did that for a while almost a year, like work from the streets. And I opened my store in 2009. I always remember that um, uh, the day I opened, I had 40 cars in inventory. And our first month we sold 65 cars. And 30 days into it, I knew I didn't want to do anything else for the rest of my life. Why, why is that? Because I made more money in that month than I would make usually in a year. <laughs> My man, <laughs> keeping it real. So now t- tell us more about that, right? You came from, and just so I understand, when you say, what was your job? You say, when I quit my job, what was that job? I was a bridge engineer. So I feel like, you know, I hearing that, it's like you sound to me like someone that had options. And I think that's, you know, that's a testament um, to the opportunity in this industry because typically, in many cases, people that you know get into the business don't have options. 
Um, and the car business, you know, low barriers to entry. I mean, there's a lot of opportunity that way if you're willing to grind, but you had options. And, and so what was it for you that really kind of sucked you in? Was it really the opportunity for, you know, kind of the American dream financial success? What was that for you? One day kind of made me want to decide to do this. I was driving from the auction and that's before I had my own car lot. And I had maybe seven or eight cars parked behind a service shop. And I used to buy uh, single ads on Autotrader and cars.com. And anytime, you know, these ads expired, I kept them active. I kept them active even though I had sold the car. So my phone would ring all day. It would not stop ringing because I will have seven cars in inventory, but 70 cars advertised. So one day I was driving from the auction and my phone kept ringing nonstop on seven cars. I told everybody to meet me there at two o'clock in the afternoon. I get there at two o'clock in the afternoon. I have 10 people wait for me. I sold all seven cars. <laughs> and, and then I knew I can make a living doing this. I love to hear it. That's incredible. Tell me about when you launched, you say you launched with 40 cars. How did you do that? And because the first thing that comes to my mind is, you know, did you own all those cars outright? Did you floor plan? It's, 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 it's hard enough to launch your first, you know, car lot. How did you launch with 40 cars? And I'm talking about 40 cars at the time. My average car was under $10,000. Um, and they were all cheap cars. And before I opened my car lot, you know, I started with seven, eight cars and I went to 15 and I went to 20 and I, you know, I knew I needed at least 30, 40 cars to open a place. So I didn't want to open a place before I had that. And I invested all my profit and all my savings in it. I mean, from the previous seven, eight years. So I put it all on the line. I even um, borrowed on credit cards. I, I, you know, that was all of it. That 40 cars was everything I owned. <laughs> what was it like with um, just, you know, thinking through, I'm sure you had kind of family in the picture, right? You're reinvesting everything in the business. You know, I was single at was the that? time, There's no family. And I remember telling my mom and dad that I want to quit my engineering um, and and uh, be a car dealer. And they were like, please don't do that, please. My dad thought it would be embarrassing, actually, to, to tell his friend that his son is a car dealer. Oh, my God. And, and what do they think now? Oh, they're very proud. So give us, I want to take a step back. Give us a, a lay of the land for a second of your business today, right? Three locations is is what I read online, uh, and I'm sure you can tell us more about that. But just tell us like high level, like how many units are you selling per year? Give us like a, little, a lay of the land. So our main store is in Raleigh. We currently have about um, 600 cars on the ground on that store, and um, we're pacing almost 300 cars sold in February. This will actually be our best February ever. We've never sold 300 cars in February. What's driving that? Because because especially at a time when lots of dealers are crying in the used market, and you're saying your best February, like tell me about that. We doubled down on inventory. Is the short answer. We went from 400 cars to 600 cars in the last couple of months, uh, and and we doubled down on staff, and we went all in. Uh, you know, ever since I started in this business, I've only had one setback, and that happened in. 2022. After 21, you know, we, we all had our best year ever. Every car dealer had his best year ever. And, um, um, things started to go backward in 2022. And, um, the, the setback was mostly caused by me taking my foot off the pedal. I, I started being less aggressive. I was concerned that the wholesale market is going to keep on shifting downward at a fast pace. I shrunk my inventory, and I would say that's the biggest mistake I've ever made in this field. The only way to be successful in this business, in my opinion, is to operate without fear. You got to be aggressive at all times. The minute you take your foot off, things start sliding down. I'll never make that mistake again. I can tell. You just, you're, you just opened up another store. Uh, former off-lease only location, which we'll get into that shortly. I'm really curious about that for anyone that doesn't know, and I'm sure most people do, off-lease, you know, huge used car operation in Florida. 
that went out of business recently and you're, you're capitalizing on that real estate, which I think is genius. Uh, so talking more about a little bit about the numbers, how, how have you recently scaled from four to 600 units? Where are you acquiring these additional units? In this particular case, we had a third store in, um, in North Carolina that we, um, it was a big store too. We had about 300 cars on the ground and um, we sold it. We got an offer. I got an offer that was really good offer. And I, I thought it was a good idea to take. So we moved our inventory from that third store to the two other stores and we retained all 60 of our staff. So it was kind of how it happened. Mm -hmm. But tell, but tell me about your actual inventory acquisition sources. Like, are you relying on auctions? Are you buying off the street? How are you getting this inventory? We buy anywhere. We buy from every auction in this country. We buy um, Mannheim, ACV, Adesso. We buy from all the rental companies. Uh, we also buy from the public. So we, we think you should pursue all options, especially you know, in this store in Florida where we had to buy 500 cars in four weeks. So you do whatever you have to do. A lot of people tell me that, you know, buying from the public, they want to do more of it, but you know, logistically it's just more work. And when you're very, you know, under-resourced, low staff, it's tough to do for the small guys, right? I'm not referring to the big companies. How, how have you been able to, you know, scale up your buy from public operations? It is tough and it's gotten tougher over the last year or so because a lot of people are upside down. That makes it more difficult. And plus, there's a lot of competition. We're talking CarMax, Carvana of the world. And, you know, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. You have to be fully committed and, and you have to hire dedicated staff. Uh, it's not a side job. Got it. So you have dedicated staff just from buying cars off the street or just total acquisition? So we have two people in this, in our Florida store that do nothing but chase, um, chase outside leads for, um, uh, uh, you know, buying from the public. Yeah. Tell me more about your business model. Like f give us the full layer of the land. Are you completely vertically integrated? Meaning do you have reconditioning in house transportation in house? Do you outsource that stuff? How do you do all that? We do all of our own reconditioning. Uh, we don't, we don't sublet anything on recon, but, uh, no, we don't do our own transportation. We're, we're mostly vertically integrated. I would say, uh, yeah, we have our own service department. We have our own, you know, detail department. We have, uh, except here in Florida, actually, because we're new. And then, so when it comes to reconditioning, how do you, um, are, how do you operate that? Like, are you doing it centralized warehouses like Carvana style or, you know, do you do it in, you know, every single store on a smaller scale? And I'm also curious to know, what are you spending per reconditioning per vehicle? We spend about $800 a car in Florida right now. The metrics for us is time to line. We like that to be seven to eight days. And, and we like it to be about $800. Uh, we don't buy a lot of rough cars. So we, usually we, we, you know, if a car doesn't make the cut, we wholesale it because that will slow down the reconditioning process and, and will affect aging. And try, we try to avoid that. And the reason why we're here actually is that we think it's a the facility was tailor made for our needs. Uh, 16 acres, you know, we can put maybe 1500 cars on the ground if we need to. Um, we got a 24,000 square foot service building that is separate from our retail building on the same property. So it was beautifully laid out for, uh, for volume. We think we can get to five or 600 cars a month here in the future. That's incredible. So who are you selling to? Like, who's your target market? Our average selling price is usually about $30,000. Uh, so, so a lot of people fall under that category. I think, you know, the average, I think the average selling price nationwide is what, 27,000 these days. So we usually between 27 and 30. Mm -hmm. what, what's your what's your percentage of subprime business? Do you think? Uh, probably twenty percent. Wow, that's a lot lower than I expected. But we're not really geared. We never really target subprime, but we take what we can get. So, when you say you don't target subprime, 
And if you're if you're going upstream, I'm going to have to assume you're operating on a pretty low gross margin per vehicle. What is like what's your gross profit per vehicle right now? It's negative on the front end. <laughs> really? Oh yeah, that's part of the plan actually. Wow, so you're operating a very aggressive model. Mm -hmm. We think it's a volume game and and when you can sell a lot of cars, you don't have to make any money on the front. So you're you're relying strictly on the back end. Well, there is a back end, there is a dock fee too. Mm -hmm. And in Florida, what's the dock fee in Florida? Ours is um, nine ninety eight. Got it. So you're relying, and then and then what's your average back end per vehicle, or like you know products, warranties, gap insurance? What are you selling that? What's your profit on that? In North Carolina, it's about twenty five hundred. Here we're not there yet because we just opened three and a half weeks. Interesting. So, you know, this kind of reminds me of, by the way, very different model from what I'm accustomed to and used to, you know, as I, we were growing our independent store, we were very much more a gross store as you'd call it, where, you know, on the actual vehicle, we were making you know, a couple grand, you know, really depend on the customer. Um, but obviously lower volume than this. I mean, we weren't doing, you know, 300 cars a month. So, you know, doesn't, it doesn't shock me. I mean, you're taking an aggressive model kind of reminds me of Echo Park how they've you know really scaled by offering very very low front end on the actual vehicle and relying you know all on the back end have you operated this model in your north carolina store for you know this entire time all these years or is this a new model for you uh, well it's the same model but uh, our front end has been going down year after year so we used to make $1000 then it was 800 then which 500 then zero and now <laughs> we're in the negative but that's always been the the the, the target uh, is to maximize volume and not focus on front end profit on a consolidated basis you are profitable right oh we're very profitable and then tell me about just about you know financing the company. Have you always have you financed everything yourself? Like, do you have any investors? How did you how did you even get to this point? So my first store it was um, you know an acre land. I was renting it for four thousand dollars a month, and I was there for five years before I moved into that current trolley store. And um, uh, you know I I. Uh, Got lucky, actually. You know, the, the right property became available at the right time. And uh, I went and bought it and got 100% financing from the bank. I don't have any investors. I don't have any partners. And, and so today, when you think about just your outlook for this year, what is your, how are you preparing for, you know, the market? What's your outlook for, you know, just like economic headwinds? Where is the customer going to be? Like how, what are, if I was a fly on the wall today and you're, you know, in your executive team meeting, right? What, what, what are you and your top leadership talking about? I feel like the economy in general has been more resilient than we all expected. And, and the demand is still here for cars. I mean, I don't think it's going anywhere. I'm, I'm, I feel positive about this year. I feel like we can have a great year. Uh, there is demand despite the high interest rate, despite the inventory challenges. I think if you execute you can you can be very profitable this year. You're an optimist. I love it. You know the, the you know how the saying goes, right? Pes pessimists sound smart. Optimists get rich. <laughs> t t tell me tell me more about lending. How did you get lenders? Right, getting lenders as a young upstart, you know, unproven per se in this business. And and for anyone that doesn't know what I mean by getting lenders, I mean you are a new dealer. You want to work with the best lenders in the country. Right, people that will approve your client. I mean, you know, the allies, the Capital Ones. I mean, and many, many more names to add to the roster. It's just not easy. So, how did you get your initial lenders? I worked very hard at that. Actually, my first four years in the business, I had zero lenders, uh, and I wasn't doing any financing. Uh, it was one random day, and an ally rep walked into my office in a smaller store, and he offered me ally. I took it, and. Uh, it was my only lenders for the next couple of years. Uh, I was begging Cap One every day. I called them every day. I sent emails every day, and they finally said yes. And once you have these two, I think the doors open. I couldn't agree more. Very similar story. Very similar story, and you know, kind of humble beginnings, right? Chasing the lenders, right? Because 
I mean, everyone knows this, right? The lenders are your opportunity. No lenders, no business at scale. My, my business model doesn't even work without any lenders, especially with losing money in the front end. <laughs> oh, I can imagine. Now, now, fast forward to today, right? What is what is it like for you with lending? Have I, with the the way the banks have tightened over the past year, where you know where interest rates are at today, right? How is lending going for you? I mean, are you seeing that as a big issue with customers? You mentioned people underwater. What are you seeing there? It's it's more challenging for sure. So so. There is people who are more upside down than there's nothing you can do for them. You know, they're ten thousand dollar upside down and they don't have the income. You can't sell them a car, so you do some opportunities there for sure. Uh, but you know, overall, I think it doesn't affect the big picture. Who are your like? Who would you say are your most the strongest lenders right now? Like, who are you putting out the most paper on the street with? Allah and Cap One still. <laughs> they're, they're one or the other usually one of them is my top lender yeah yeah and i can't say it's too surprising i mean they're obviously you know very powerful lenders in this industry t t tell me more about on your inventory acquisition side what do you do with the inventory you wholesale where do you wholesale out uh mostly acv actually uh, some might have expressed too, but I say, you know, mostly ACV. I don't want to send cars to the lane, transport them and bring them back. Uh, ACV and Manham Express make it easy. They come, they do their condition report. You can sell it, not sell it. They charge reasonable fees uh, as opposed to the lane. Uh, it works for the most part. And and how do you choose at your store? How do you decide what you're retailing versus wholesaling? Or just in general, how do you manage your inventory? Like, are you like a, a store where at 60 days you send it, shoot it to the auction? Or what, what's your method? I don't have a hard cutoff day. I've never had one. I, I The way I look at it is I don't want a certain percentage of my inventory, say 15% of my inventory shouldn't be more than 60 days old. But uh, uh, it doesn't mean I can't have one here that is 100 days old. So what do you look at? I mean, are you looking at your equity in the vehicle relative to book value, your cost relative? Like, what are you looking at? I, I want to retail it. My goal is to retail it because I can overcome front-end losses most cases if I retail a car by selling a warranty, by getting finance, by adding a dog fee. It, I'm more likely to recover by retailing the car. So unless I can't retail it, I'm not going to wholesale it. I mean, if a car doesn't have any leads, nobody's looking at the car, then I know I can't retail it. Okay, so let's talk about that, right? Speaking of leads, right? Because you're a low margin store, you work on volume. How are you marketing? Like everyone else, really. Car gurus, auto trader, cars.com, true cars, all the third party advertisers, we use them all. We also do Google, VLAs. SEM, paid churches, we do it all. T tell me more about um, your expansion to Florida, right? Was this like opportunistic for you, right? When you saw the off-lease property or did you did you have a plan, hey, I want to move into Florida? I've always had an eye towards Florida. And when we sold the store in North Carolina, I became more serious about it. And, you know, when off-lease went out of business and had a feeling that these properties would surface. So I, I went after that. I actually went and looked at all of them. And uh, I picked this one because I felt it was the nicest property of them all, facility-wise. I've always heard about people putting up big numbers in Florida, you know, from off-lease to H. Greg and others, independent. So I figured if they can do it, maybe I can. I mean, I don't blame you. I mean, obviously, Florida is a super booming market. Population has been growing like crazy. Uh, competition has been growing as well. It's not an easy market. Well, what's the hardest part? Um, for me right now, trying to figure it out because <laughs> I'm new at it. Well, what's specific? I mean, do you have the team with you or are you hiring people? Like, where are you at right now? Oh, I'm fully operational. We've hired... Um, almost 70 people in the last 30 days. Wow, what what roles? Everything, you know, technicians, service managers, 
sales coordinates, finance, uh, accounting, buyers, detail, the whole nine. So when, when you say accounting, are you operating, are you decentralized? Meaning, do you have anything that's strictly at North Carolina? Or are you operating in a way where, you know, each store has its own, you know, controller and stuff like that? How are you operating? We are centralized in Raleigh, North Carolina for now, but you still have to have people in the ground at every store. And how many people are, is your entire company total? Close to 200. What do you, what's your outlook for revenue? Like how many, you know, what do you think your revenue is going to be this year? How many units are you planning on selling? Projecting about 600 cars a month combined. So at 600 a month, you said roughly $30,000 average ticket. I mean, you're going to be, you're likely going to be doing over $200 million a year in sales. Oh well, yeah, we'll, we'll exceed 200. You know, if someone's listening to this, you know, small dealer, maybe doing a couple million in sales a year and has visions and aspirations of growing to being a size, like, to being in a similar scale as you, I mean, what do you have to tell them, right? Like, what, what was what has been the most important lessons for you going from, you know, selling cars in the back of a service shop to doing over $200 million a year in sales? There isn't any secret sauce, to be honest with you, but the... the the most important aspect of our operation is managing the inventory. Because when you, you know, have 40 or $50 million worth of cars, you want to minimize your risk. And, and, and that's the most difficult part. And it's been quite difficult over the last few years, couple of years at least. But other than that, you know, everybody knows, you know, you got to maximize your PVR. You got to have volume. You got to recondition your car the right way. You can't overspend on advertising. You can't overspend on reconditioning, time to line. Uh, these are all important. I mean, it doesn't work unless it's all clicking together. Yeah, it's the, it's the most complicated, simple business in the world, right? Like you said, it's all it's just about the fundamentals. I mean, you really, if you don't have the right reconditioning team, if you don't have the right, you know, F&I department, if, if it, it doesn't work, it, it just doesn't. Everything has to work. Mm -hmm. Have you ever considered going franchise? I have, actually. <laughs> You're smiling. Do you, are you, do you have a contract right now? Are you under agreement? There's something in the work I'm not at liberty to discuss right now. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, I think, you know, doesn't, doesn't surprise me. I feel like you're at that scale where we typically see, you know, lots of independents kind of, you know, starting to sniff around in the franchise world. I, I never wanted to be a franchise dealer until I saw what happened in 2021 and I was jealous. <laughs> what are your biggest challenges right now specifically, right? Like if there's someone listening to this that can reach out to you, whether it be a potential, you know, sales manager, or a lender, who knows what, right? What are some challenges, like real tactical finding challenges the right that you're facing? People, finding, finding the right person at the right job is the most challenging part by far. It's people. It's always people. Uh, if you don't surround yourself by the right people, I mean, you'll never be successful. Uh, I, I'm not going to personally sell 607 cars a month. I can't do it. I have to have the quality people around me from in every department. Otherwise, I think that's by far the most challenging part about it. And I'm going through it in Florida right now. And uh, it's not easy. It's not easy. How have you been acquiring talent? Where have you been finding people? Like just traditional, you know, Indeeds, LinkedIn, stuff like that? Or what are you doing? That, yeah, I would say mostly that. And 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 in this tour, we might have done a little bit different. We we, we recruited some old employees from off lease and uh, they put us in touch with some others and uh, that helped a little bit. I love to hear it. So t tell me more about your plans for the group. I mean, you just opened your third store. You were hinting potentially at a franchise some point down the line. You know, any any other big plans for you? It's not a solid plan, to be honest with you, but the idea is to potentially grow in the Florida market, uh, Orlando maybe, and, and maybe other locations in Florida. But we're focused on the store right now, and we might also have a franchise play coming up. So... Uh, we're not pursuing that right now. So selfish question, how did you come across Car Dealership Guy? Like, I'm just totally curious, you know, or what platforms do you consume? Like, tell me a little bit about that. Uh, actually, my, um, 
my controller told me about you the first time. She was like, do you follow the car dealership guy on Instagram? And I said, nope, I've never heard of it. And she said, you need to, because I follow him and I don't know anything about the car business, but I find it interesting. So I started doing that that same day. <laughs> I love it. On Instagram? On Instagram. Actually, most of us, uh, most of my, you know, most of our staff follow you now. So well, I encourage everybody to do that. You know, sometimes you post something about, um, you know, MSRP discount. And I'm like, well, I'm glad he did that because I don't want to go buy a 2023 used one that they just dropped price on. Yeah, you get to see, I mean, I, you know what I call it? Um, I called it the other day, like it's, I'm trying to sort of create this, you know, the collective intelligence of the automotive industry. So with everyone sending me all this stuff all the time, it gives me this crazy opportunity to really filter, like, you know, make sense of it all and push it out to the world in real time. And so, you know, we have, we share recall information before it's published. You know, you see price drops in real time before it even gets to the auction because you see it already happening on the retail sale. Um, so that's actually really cool intel. Love to hear that. It's definitely working for you. It's exploding, isn't it? Try my best. And I and I and I think the best part is the the diversity of of um of guests like on this platform, right? Like, you know, you are an a growing used car dealer. Suddenly next week I may have, you know, a multi-billion dollar franchise dealer, followed by a vendor that's using AI to innovate the car. Like there's so many different, you know, kind of walks of life in the industry. And that's actually my favorite part because I don't want to be I talk about this all the time. I don't want to just appeal to you know one uh, one sector versus the other. I really want to bring a well rounded perspective to the industry, and so you know it keeps it keeps the conversations interesting. You know, I would love for you guys to come visit us one day so we can show you in person what we do. Um, it'd be fun, I think. Well, we're going to be doing a lot more of that. Uh, we're planning a bunch of uh, in-person, you know, activations. We call it now that again, I'm out in the world. Uh, it's a lot easier to commit to these types of things. Actually, you just mentioned Orlando. Um, I think we had an opportunity request down there. There was uh, a couple others, you know, in in Philadelphia where I'm based, and, and all over the place. But long story short, is you know we are going to be doing more in-person activations. And generally speaking, you know, you should definitely you know expect to see us more out there in the wild in the in the next year. Yeah, I'm very proud of this facility in Florida and I would love to show it to you guys. I love it and I'd love to see it. You know, so before we wrap up, just tell me, you know, what's your outlook for the independent dealer? I mean, you've you've done a really good job at scaling your your business. You know, you've clearly been very disciplined. I love your focus on the fundamentals. How do you feel about the, you know, the uh, just the state of the independent dealership over the coming years? How do you think about that? The future is bright, in my opinion. Uh, big scale independent dealers will be even more dominant in the future, in my estimation. I feel like new car dealers will go back to selling new cars and they'll focus on that. The small pops and shop stores are just not equipped. I think we have a bright future. I think we're here to stay. And, and uh, you know, EVs, doesn't necessarily hurt us. I think they might even help. Why do you say that? Because you can sell a lot of used EVs, especially when you can get a rebate on them. And lots of dealers have taken advantage of that. So time will tell how it all shakes out. Um, but there's definitely opportunity. And I think it's easy to get drowned into like that negativity and like, oh, it's, you know, it's gonna hurt this, it's gonna hurt service. But you're right. Like it's always there's always opportunity out there. That's the right outlook. As long as there is demand um, and and the economy stays resilient, we'll be fine, I think. Pending any major economical setbacks, I think the market will, will, will continue to thrive. Eliana, this was this was really, really great. I wish you lots of success with the new store. Um, that's number one. Number two is we'll put your website and link in the show notes below. If anyone wants to reach out to you, uh, reach out to the store, you know, is looking for an opportunity in in florida um you know they can reach out to you directly and so we'd love to kind of pass on that information and uh maybe 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 soon enough you'll give us a tour of your facility as well i'd love to thank you for um having me on your podcast i really enjoyed it all right hope you enjoyed that episode please give the podcast a rating consider subscribing to the show and check the show notes for links to what we talked about thanks for tuning in i'll see you guys next time